wall. Hello, and welcome to the very first episode of the Weekly Pleb. My name is Douglas Rieger, and I'm your host. Thank you for tuning in. Today, I wanted to talk to you guys for a little bit about stimulus talks and government relief during the coronavirus, but it's a pretty depressing and infuriating subject, so I decided I'd tell it to you in the fashion of a classic Christmas tale. This is the story of how the U.S. government stole Christmas. There once was two Grinches up in their ivory tower, two very ancient beings clenching onto their power. Americans in Americaville are stuck in their houses, thanks to the horrible mismanagement of a global pandemic by a federal government with no clear regards for human life or suffering. Can't go to dinner at Applebee's or get in a bar bar. The American economy's going to slow to a crawl. Less people are working and less people are buying. It's simple economics, folks. Anyone who says otherwise is lying. Our two heartless Grinches bickered for eight long months. Neither gave a few inches to get something f***ing done. Give billions to the rich, just a few pennies to us. She's got a $50,000 fridge. He's worth 20 million bucks. Rich oligarchs in a democracy? It should make you say what the f***. Come on, Mitch and Nancy. It's time to pass us a buck. For many, the future looks bleak. It's sad, but it's true. It's up to you to just speak. Yes, it's really up to you. Tell everyone you know, I really wish it was funny. Call your congressmen and senators. Tell them the people need money. That was definitely a much faster and more Christmassy way for me to get my point across. Without further ado, let's get right into the interview with today's guest expert. It is my great pleasure to introduce the Weekly Pub's very first guest expert, entomologist from Virginia Tech and pre-Paul Rudd Ant-Man, my good friend, Robert Ostrom. How are you, Robert? Doing well. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thanks for being here. It's been a long time. I can't remember the last time we've spoken other than text. I know, for real. You, It's it's cool, though, catching up with, with old friends, especially with yeah. this, the podcast going on. Yeah, of course. I'm happy to have you. How's Gus? Gus is doing well. Um, he's currently sleeping on my bed. Yeah. Um, yeah. Classic. Super wrinkly. He's like an old <laughs> man and a puppy. He's a basset hound for, for yeah. the people who don't know. Um, yeah. He's like eight months old, but has the face of someone who's 80 years. So <laughs> Love it. Love it. Yeah. Uh, Robert, like me and many other people during the COVID era, uh, got a puppy and decided it was a good thing to do. Can't disagree. It was a great idea. But so how did you first get into entomology? Bugs. Why bugs? Um so <laughs> that's a that's a pretty good question. Um I initially wanted to do something in the realm of politics. Um I ended up working in a bunch of different jobs, um, internships, um, all across what you can do in politics and I decided that I didn't like it. So um, after working with leeches and bloodsuckers for a couple of years, I figured it'd be a pretty nice switch. Yeah, pretty pretty typical politics. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but in actuality, um, I did a paper in high school on ants, all about their social structure, how their colonies work. Um, and it made me realize that there was a lot more to insects than I thought beforehand. Mm-hmm. And then whenever I got to university um i had a single entomology professor for the whole campus um and i just really liked his classes ended up doing independent research um took off from there very cool so back in high school when you did the ant paper it, if i remember correctly you used the subject of ants for several different classes tell me about that yeah um <laughs> so i guess i wanted to see how, I mean, as, as a high schooler, right, you're trying to do the least amount of work with and get the greatest amount of results. So I wanted to pick a topic that everyone knew about, but no one really knew about and see how many different classes I could, I could tie it to. So I picked ants. Um, I ended up doing like an art history project on ants. Um, it was, it was kind of crazy, but (laughs) it was fun to do. 
Yeah. So lately you've been more uh, focused on bees, right? Yes. So I'm currently studying bees at Virginia Tech for my master's. And have you, you've done a, you've done a few studies for, with bees, right? I've done an undergrad uh, population survey of bees in okay. the city of Richmond, Virginia. And the population is decreasing, right? Correct? Everywhere. Um, so that's, you've opened a whole can of worms right there. That's um, nice. Yeah, everyone says like, you know, bees are declining at a rapid rate. Um, but it's, it's a lot more complicated than that. Um, okay. and it's not quite so, I guess, perilous as as it makes it out to seem um so when most people think of bees they think of a specific type of bee what's your go-to bee that you think of a honeybee the african bee so yeah you you hit the nail on the head most people think of the honeybee um and of course that bee is used in agriculture for our food um at least most of the food here in in the united states um and the thing that a lot of people don't know about honeybees, though, is that they're not native to the United States. Okay. Um, so we use the European honeybee. Um, and it's been successful in kind of finding places to live in the United States. Um, but there's no native population to be endangered. So, so they weren't even supposed to be here in the first place. Exactly. Exactly. Okay, uh, so no wonder they're they have the colony collapse. They're not, they're like, this is my, well, my and the, home. Yeah, the, the whole colony collapse thing is, um, I mean, we don't really know what, what causes it specifically, but one of the biggest stressors on bees is that um, the almond industry is really reliant on honeybees. And so every season that honeybees uh, or that almonds need to be pollinated, like 90% or something incredibly high of the entire nation's honeybees are driven out to California to pollinate these almonds. And of course, when you're packing bees on a truck, driving them hundreds of miles, yeah. you know, that's, that stresses them out. You get them of mixed course. up with other bees from other places, tons of diseases. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. See, I, I had heard about the, the almond industry where they ship them out to California, California every year, but I didn't know it was 90%, something like that. That's, that's an insane amount. It's it's definitely the majority of of commercial honeybees. Wow, wow! And yeah. I mean, from the business side of it, it's it's interesting because the consumption of honey has like been steadily going up for years. Right. But we're having like half of the honeybees die every year, something like that. I I don't know. But, that yeah. Right. So the the they they're cutting this honey with like uh, sugar, rice sugar, corn mm-hmm. syrup, things like that. So we're not even actually getting any honey. Right. And so it puts um, specifically American beekeepers at a really tough spot because they're facing competition from uh, foreign honey producers, which isn't real honey, and they can undercut the market. Yeah. Um, so they, American honey producers have to ship their bees out to places like the almonds to get the money to keep going, um, which puts more stress on their bees, which makes them even less competitive in the market as a whole. Okay. Wow. Yeah. See, that doesn't sound like a a good future for the honey industry. It's not, but we're getting better at testing for fraudulent honey. Um, One of the big, well, the the biggest kind of, at least international uh, cheater in the honey industry is, is China. Um, And so I think there was a recently some legislation passed that either made it harder for Chinese honey to enter the market or banned it completely. Um, the problem now is that they're shipping it to intermediaries in Indonesia, the Philippines, um, putting them on, you know, boats marked with those flags. And then suddenly yeah. it's not Chinese honey. It's, yeah. you know, different countries, honey. Yeah. Okay. That could be a logistical nightmare. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, but there's really cool research being done. Um, tying back the pollen that bees use to make specific types of honey. So labs are able to take a jar of honey and see if it was made on trees that are native to the United States or trees that are mostly native to China. And if that's the case, then that batch of honey is a little bit more dubious as to, you know, maybe we need to do more testing to make sure this is real honey. That's pretty cool that they've been able to figure that out. 
tell me about the bee dance. I remember that they dance. Tell me about yeah. the bee dancing. And why do they dance? What is that for? <laughs> so honeybees are, are social insects. Um, like cockroaches, or not cockroaches, but termites, uh, ants, the like. Um, and one kind of big thing that social insects do is that they, they share their food. Um, so in any colony of honeybees, you're going to have scouts that go out and look for um, water or a nice bloom of flowers or maybe even like a, a better place to, to stay. Um, but whenever the bee finds something that they're excited about, they go back and they need to communicate that somehow to other bees in the hive. Um, so the way that they do this is they have what's called a waggle dance. Um, <laughs> so they'll pick somewhere like on the hive and kind of run in one direction while wiggling their abdomen. Okay. So twerking, the bees twerk. <laughs> they're, they're basically twerking. Yeah. Okay, okay. Um, and then they'll, they'll run back and keep doing that. Um, and so we knew that that was somehow tied to bees communicating. Um, but research has found that the waggle dance can actually be decoded. Um, so the length of time that they're, they're doing this waggle dance, how quickly they're doing it, um, all me- has like some certain meaning to it. For example, yeah. the, they point their abdomen a certain direction while they're waggling. Um, and the angle from their abdomen to the sun correlates to the forage that they're talking about. The okay. distance that they're, they're dancing is correlated to how far away the resource is. So it's, okay. it's so really they find cool. stuff. So they find stuff and they come back to the nest and then they tell everyone and they're like, they don't believe them. So they have to explain where it's at. So then they can all go check it out themselves. Right. It, yeah, pretty much. Okay. Very cool. Yeah. Okay. I want to ask you about a couple of things about ants because this has been getting in my brain and so <laughs> and I don't understand it. They have I don't know if it's all kinds of ants or just some kinds of ants, but they have a caste system based on what they eat. Is that right? Yes. Wow. Okay. You need to explain something because <laughs> like I don't get it. Okay. Um. So most people have heard of like a queen ant. Um, and of course the queen is the same type of species as the other ants in her colony. Um, she's just a different cast of ant. So it's not really that they have separate, like, strata of life. It's just that they're, they're biologically different. And the way that that's determined, um, is that whenever ants are born and they, well, there, there's an egg and they hatch from the egg, right? Um, they're in a larval stage and that larva is kind of, think of like a caterpillar for a butterfly, um, can't really fend for itself, very different from its adult form, mostly helpless. Um, it gets fed food from the other ants in the colony and depending on the amount of food that it gets, um, that will allow it to grow bigger or have, um, stronger mandibles. So that differentiates between the the minor workers like the really small ants and then the bigger ones that can you know carry leaves different places or will like protect the colony okay so do we know how they determine like oh this ant is going to eat this stuff so then you can be a soldier or you're going to eat this stuff so then you can be a worker like how do we know if it's just is it just random like we have no clue why or how they decide what they're going to eat um so i don't know exactly but it seems to be that in general um when the colony starts out it has less food to give its larva and so those first few ants that are born are going to be like smaller workers um as the colony gets bigger and it has more food to spare um it can produce the bigger more specialized um polymorphic ants um and then as far as actual mating ants, that's, that's kind of a different story, but there's some evidence that um, DNA has a really big impact on casts in some species. Okay. 
So in some ways, it, it could just be the rationing of the colony, and then it also could be genetic. It could be a combination somehow. Right. And it seems to be that not all ant species have the same um, determination system. Yeah. Okay. For that. Have you ever seen those uh, the zombie ants with the that are infected by the fungus? No, I haven't, but I, I really want to one day. Well, you've heard of them, right? You haven't oh, seen yeah. them in person. Yeah, yeah. I think that's what the um the game um The Last of Us was based off of this fungus just creating like zombies. Really? The entire yeah. game is based off of the zombie the, the zombie fungus in the ants. Right, right. That's funny. That's a great game. But yeah, I I I mushrooms, that's a whole nother topic. They're pretty incredible too. <laughs> but uh you you mentioned earlier, or you you said roaches could be or a social animal or insects, but then you retracted that. Is that not? I I was under the impression that they were social because my entomology teacher gave this example where we love ladybugs. You know, most kids are like, oh, ladybugs are super cute, but in reality, they're they're cannibals and they eat their kids, right? <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. But then he compared them to roaches, where everyone thinks roaches are gross and disgusting. But in reality, they're very loving family members, and the mother takes care of its litter and everything like that. Mm -hmm. So are they are they social? Or are they um, so as far as, like, in general, I guess they would be more social than some insects. Um, when I was thinking earlier about, like, bees and ants, I was thinking about eusociality, which is kind of the highest form of uh, social structure in insects. And the reason I got tripped up about uh, cockroaches is because recently uh, termites have been kind of reorganized in the tree of life to be, they're now considered social cockroaches. Um, Wait, termites are now cockroaches. Right. Termites are a specialized cockroach, which aren't they has like su Aren't they like colony. super, super tiny? Are they like that big? Oh, yeah, but they also have, like, the queen termite, which, it, don't look up pictures of that because it's gross. <laughs> uh, but it's, like, it's much bigger than the other members of its its uh, colony. So how recent is that, that they decided that termites are no longer termites? They just took their name away without even consulting the termites. <laughs> uh, um, I mean, I think we still call them termites, um, but oh, they're yeah. definitely, like, underneath the umbrella of cockroaches now. Um, I think that was in the past few years. So it's definitely a, a newer discovery. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. I hadn't heard about that. Um, so speaking of ladybugs, and I, I know I've heard of other cannibalistic insects, mm -hmm. right? Is that is that a common thing? Are there a lot of insects that eat other kinds of the same insect? Oh, yeah. Um, I think the vast, yeah, I, I'd say that the vast majority of insects who are, at least omnivorous or car carnivorous are would be cannibals if they if they get the choice. Um, I mean, you, you even see that within like mating pairs. Um, the the male praying mantis literally lets the female eat his head while they're mating. Um, King -king. In jumping spiders, <laughs> yeah, it's it's a pretty pretty rough rough go of things. Um, but the, I think the the exceptions to the rules are. Uh, once again, social insects. So ants of the same colony, for example, will have a specific scent or pheromone that their queen kind of gives off. And so they will recognize that on other ants of their colony and they won't eat like their, their brothers or sisters. Um, what's, what's really interesting, though, is that two ants of the same species of colonies like across your yard might eat each other because they a, smell a, different a fight to the death that you don't even see in the backyard yeah exactly <laughs> how do ants do you know how ants do their highways they have like you know what i mean like uh, like I, walking I, behind I one another well i think it's like leaf cutter ants specifically that can like create paths in the in like forest oh, ground sure. and then yeah. like just continuously use those all, all mm -hmm. the time so is that that's just more social stuff, you know, they're just following each other, right? I think it's I think it's that and also um I think the ones that literally clear out vegetation um often live in more jungle areas. Um 
and so they need kind of they have a larger I guess territory for a colony than you would in you know your your driveway or something yeah. um, and they need those avenues to get to and from places faster so they probably have scouts similar to the bees huh. oh yeah. yeah um I think there was a statistic that I read a while back, but if you take the pounds of meat consumed per square mile um, out of any animal in the jungle, ants consume like the vast majority of that. They consume than, the most. Oh yeah, more than any other animal. Including humans. Um, I'm not sure if they consider humans, but certainly out of, out of wild animals. Like yeah. tigers, not a shot. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> that's funny. Well, there's a lot more ants than there are tigers, right? <laughs> yeah, the the weight of ants in the world combined outweighs the weight of humans in the world combined. That's an insane picture. It's yeah. a weird, weird thought, yeah. <laughs> I, I remember, I don't remember the exact figure, but my teacher explained that there's something like, I think there's 50,000 spiders in every square mile on average. And then it was like a billion insects every square mile or something like that. Like unbelievable numbers, yeah. It's yeah. crazy amount. Yeah. All right, I want to go back to bees real quick because you mentioned that you don't think there really. It sounded like you don't think there really is a bee problem. The, the bees are dying. The bees are dying. Like everyone cries. Um. So there's definitely a problem. I think it's just mischaracterized a little bit. Um. Because the the honey bee isn't in danger of going extinct. Um, and the agriculture industry is putting a lot of money out there to promote the Save the Bee campaign because that's that's what they rely on. Um, and the agriculture industry is facing a really tough situation where like 40 to 50 percent of the bees in the U.S., the, the honeybees, are dying each year. Um, but they're not going to go extinct because they're not native here and farmers or the industry just buys new queens from Europe where they're fine. Um, so there, there's no colony collapse problems or anything like that in Europe with the honeybee? There, there definitely is, but um, it's not something that's going to make honeybees go extinct. Okay. Um, colony collapse disorder seems to be, um, at least from what I've read, more with managed hives, and it seems to have something to do with a variety of stressors. Um, obviously, we don't know what's causing it. That's why it's a, a really big mystery, but um it was it wasn't recorded with like honey beehives out in the wild this is something that we've only recently started to to notice within the past like 20 years or something okay well other bee populations that aren't honey bees uh they're doing fine in the u.s or vastly they're doing okay so that's that's really what the problem is um there are a handful of bees that are listed as federally endangered. Most of them are in Hawaii, um, oddly enough. But um, we don't really have enough data to know what the native bee populations look like. Um, a lot of them nest in the ground, or if they don't nest in the ground, they'll nest in like twigs. And it's a lot harder to measure the population of something that you need to sit around with either like set up a camera and maybe you'll see three or five a day um, versus a honey beehive, which has thousands and thousands of bees in one like cubic meter in, in the hive. Um, we do have reports of insects in general decreasing in population. Um, even that, some people say that there isn't enough data to make broad sweeping strokes about the global insect population. Um, so. It's, it's kind of a mixed bag. We're seeing that some insects are doing better um, while others are doing worse. So that's an interesting thing to think about. What would happen potentially if, let's say, all the insects just disappeared? We couldn't survive, right? There's no way we can exist without insects. Um, yeah, I, th I think that we either wouldn't be able to survive or life as we know it would be drastically different. I mean, you think of the obvious things, you know, you wouldn't be bit by mosquitoes anymore, but um, <laughs> yeah, it would, <laughs> it would have like a really drastic effect on life in general. I mean, pollination would be disrupted. So a lot of 
plants just wouldn't be able to reproduce or we'd have to do it by hand. Um, a lot of really anything that's bigger than an insect and doesn't eat plants is going to die off because if they don't eat insects directly, they eat something, they eat something smaller, they eat something smaller, they eat a bug, right? Yeah. Um, so we don't so have world to would be, be vegetarians, essentially. Yeah, and, and even that would be would be difficult because <laughs> you still need to pollinate the plants. So are honeybees the only bee that pollinates plants? That's not. It's got to be other bees too, right? Yeah, so all types of bees um, pollinate pretty much. There's some exceptions that are more parasitic than pollinators, but um, even insects that aren't bees will pollinate. So you have butterflies. Um, there's some like beetles that you know just crawl along flowers and pick up pollen. Um, but bees are definitely one of the major pollinators. Flies as well. Flies do a lot of pollinating. Um, and what's really important about native bees is that they've often co-evolved with the native plants in the area for thousands of years. So whenever they hatch from eggs is often around the same time window as when their corresponding native plant will go into bloom. Um, and their tongues or their like hairs that collect pollen will often be like just the right length to get the nectar um, or to like brush up against the pollen. So there are some plants that can only be pollinated by like one or two species of native bees. Hmm. Uh, do you think it's ever possible that we could have like AI powered robot bees that do pollinating for the bees that no longer are there? Um, do I think that it's possible? Sure. Um, I think that it's pretty unlikely. And if we do accomplish that, um, I think we're going to focus on like a handful of plants. Um, one it's of the great things, things about, need. right, right. So it's going to be like food. Um, a lot of wild, wildflowers are going to just like die because you can't build something that quick. Yeah. Um, and that's one of the greatest things about honeybees and why the agriculture industry uses them is because they'll feed on anything. Um, whereas a lot of native bees are specific to that one plant that they've evolved with. Okay. So a lot of plants have come to rely on the bees and if they're not there, they might not take to some new advanced version of a bee. It's right. Like, no, that's not the homie, you know, that's been <laughs> for, for years since way back. Exactly. <laughs> All right, Robert. Well, thank you for coming on. It was great talking to you. Great learning about the bees and uh, we need to catch up again soon. Yeah. Anytime. Just, just call me up. I'll talk your ear off about bugs. Mm -hmm.